what Judy said? Hello and good morning. Hello, good morning. That's pretty weak, but I'll allow it because I'm feeling kind of weak too. Today, we are going to use our imaginations. Why you guys close your eyes? Close them good. And I want you to think that you have 100 toys. 100 toys, and you love them. They are the best things in the world, and you love all 100 of them equally. You don't have a favorite. You love all 100 toys, and they are the best things ever. But then what happens if you lose one? If you lose one toy, and you love them all exactly equal. You got 99. Right, but what are you going to do if you lose one? After you get done crying, what are you going to do? You're going to look for it? Because you love that one just as much as you love the rest of them, right? Now open your eyes. Jesus told stories called parables. Okay? And he told one about some sheep. Hmm? What? What? Sheep. I love it when the sheep are standing up. But they're standing up. So Jesus told the story, the parable, about the sheep. He said, well, if a shepherd has a has hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, doesn't he leave those 99 sitting there and go look for that one sheep? It's just like all your toys, right? You're going to leave those 99 toys and you're going to go look for that one because you love them all. The shepherd loves all his sheep. Well, the same thing goes for Jesus and with us. You know, if there's a hundred of us here, Jesus loves all of us. But if one of us gets out of line and goes astray, Jesus is going to seek you out because he loves all of us equally. And then he's going to bring you back in and shout for joy because he's found that lost sheep or he's found that lost person just like you found that lost toy. Right? So <clears throat> It's just like, just like searching and finding something. You're always happy when you find it. All of heaven will rejoice over one person being found. Right? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for these lessons. Thank you for loving us enough to leave 99 to come find the one. Father, help our children learn and forgive us where we failed you. In your matchless name, amen. No guarantees I can make it through this music. Let's stand and sing number 257. Number 257.
So happy to see everybody on this beautiful Sunday morning. It's a little cooler outside than it was this time last week, but uh, I'm thankful for the warmth in our hearts here this morning. Uh, Brother Jim, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another wonderful day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be in your house, singing your praises, to hear your word. We ask you to bring Brother Tom to the service, uh, give him the words that we need to hear. Uh, the ones that will be requesting prayer today, uh, you know each request, one we know what to ask you for, or each request according to your will. Be with us again throughout this service. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you in advance for all you're going to do. Thank you most of all for your son Jesus. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Um, any prayer requests this morning that you need to remember? Please I've got two people this morning, Josh. My uncle John Price is over Liberty. They uh, sent him back to the nurse home to uh, live what little time he's got left. Okay. And then I've got Aunt Joanne in Ohio. She is following and she's not doing too good. She's in a rehab, so she's 90 year old. Remember that to Joanne? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else this morning? Jay Hansford. Jay Hansford. Yeah, we'll continue. Remember, I, I think I've asked for prayer for him before, but my, my friend Steve Barber remembered him in prayer. He has a, he's had a, a, a series of kidney issues and is on a transplant transplant this. Also, it's dealing with gout this week, so uh, keep him in prayer. Oh, yes, that's right. The final test, he, he has a possible donor, and the final test to make sure that their match is happening tomorrow, so I pray that that goes well. Uh, and then a, a good friend of ours, uh, Curtis Morrison, his, uh, his mother, uh, sweet, sweet lady, songwriter, wonderful saint of God, uh, had a had a stroke and um, quite a bit, I think, more massive than what they thought it was. And uh, and then we go and call the family, and I, I can't remember her first name, but uh, I remember her. He had a calling off this in. Uh, prayer for the Ingram family. A uh, close friend of mine passed away just real suddenly the other day. Uh, he was a father. Take a moment and take these requests of the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings, first of all, that we are able to gather here together and for the privilege of prayer that we can bring these requests to you. Our Lord, uh, as, we, as we pray and we commune with you, Lord, uh, first of all, we, we acknowledge that you're the only one that can, can truly fix these. You're the only one that truly has the answers that we seek. So God, we, we, uh, we put you first. And uh, just like Jesus commanded his disciples to pray, uh, we acknowledge you as, as our Father in heaven. And, and we trust and believe that you are able to move in these, as your word says, exceedingly abundantly, more than what we can ever ask or think. Uh, Lord, whether it be by miraculous touch, Lord, whether it be by a doctor's hand, uh, Lord, an encouraging word that's spoken. Uh, somebody uh, saying something just at the right time, Lord, you can move and you can lead and guide and direct people's lives in way, ways that we don't even understand. So we pray for you to bring peace, give answers, give help, because you're the one that our help comes from. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, any birthdays or anniversaries? 
Jim just had a birthday. We didn't get to see him last week. Well, Tony had a birthday not long ago. Uh, anybody else coming up here? All right, we'll sing to him.
275. Number 275. Well, there's a, uh, a story that we're going to take a look at today that um, seems like the past couple of weeks we've been looking at some of these Old Testament stories. I know Brinkley likes some good Old Testament stories. So we're going to look in the book of Exodus this morning. And uh, this is a passage that, that uh, for many of you Bible readers, it'll be somewhat familiar um, it's not quite as common of a passage as maybe some of the other things that we read about from Exodus. You know, we read about uh, Moses in the, in the bulrushes, and we read about uh, maybe the, uh, all of the different plagues that came upon Egypt. We read about the Ten Commandments and, and the children of Israel. And, and even last week, we, we learned about, uh, or, yeah, uh, we learned about the manna. But uh, this is one that's a little bit less common, but, but still some of you may be familiar with. Um, but I, I want to show how all throughout Scripture, um, you know, Scripture, our Holy Bible that we hold in our hands, that we look at every time we come to church, and hopefully we're looking at and reading and in every day, you know, it's 66 different books by so many different authors and, and was written in, in a few different languages. 
and yet we have a copy of it here and it's 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 in our language that we can read and it's all put together and and um there is not one verse that disagrees with another verse now that there may be some things that that immediately on first reading we don't fully understand but i don't believe that there is any part of the scripture that contradicts any other part rather i believe it complements every other part and i want to show us today through god's word how that is true uh, but we're in the book of exodus book of exodus we're going to start at chapter 17. Uh, exodus chapter 17 and verse 8 says this then came amalek and fought with israel in rephidim and moses said unto joshua choose us out men and go out fight with amalek tomorrow i will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of god in mine hand let's pray dear heavenly father thank you for the gift of your word thank you that we do believe that it is holy, infallible, perfect, Lord, a living, breathing word, one that we look at and, and, and we can find something new uh, to apply to our lives every time we look. Father, thank you that, uh, that you have preserved it for us so that we can know you, that we can have that opportunity to have a relationship with you. And Lord, I pray through the message today, through the preaching, that you would, uh, Lord, allow your light to shine through me and, and, and Lord, that I would just stand out of the way. And Father, that uh, for the congregation that is here, Lord, that we would be hearers and doers. Uh, Lord, not just, not just listeners, Lord, not just like we're listening or hearing a noise, but rather that we realize it's your word being proclaimed. And we thank you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask all these things. Amen. Give you a little background on what's happening here. Again, we're familiar with what happened with Israel in Egypt. Uh, God appeared to Moses in this burning bush that wasn't consumed, told him that he wanted him to uh, go down to Pharaoh, ask him to let God's people go. Pharaoh said no. We saw the ten plagues that happened. Uh, we saw that Aaron kind of served as, uh, uh, Moses' brother Aaron served as, as his mouthpiece because Moses was, uh, his first excuse that he gave God was that he was afraid to talk. Or that he was not a man of, of that he was a man of slow speech, he said. And so Moses and Aaron are kind of working with each other, and and finally they are being led out of Egypt. They've seen the miracle already happen at the Red Sea. Uh, they have experienced this freedom from bondage, and uh, and they've they've begun to see some of these miracles of how God is providing for them, and of course. We know that because of the children of Israel's disobedience, they, they were uh, wandering in the wilderness for 40 years on what really should have been about a three-day journey, uh, perhaps a week, just with that great number of people, but not a 40-year journey. But yet, they wandered in the wilderness, and uh, but as they began to get closer to the promised land, and as they began to head in that direction, again, obeying what God had for them to do, uh, their enemies were trying to keep them at bay. And the closer that they got to the promised land, the worse that it seemed to get. And this passage that we read here is really the first time that Israel was having to go to battle on their way to Canaan. Uh, they had not yet gone into that land. They weren't yet, you know, conquering the, the cities and nations of that land. This is before Jericho. This is before all of those places. But... While they were on their way, news was already kind of traveling. Uh, when the entire Egyptian army gets swallowed up by the Red Sea, that begins to get out. And these other nations are, are hearing, and these other people and, and tribes are, are hearing that this God of Israel is fighting for them. That this God of Israel is powerful. And because many of these nations uh, worshipped other gods, they, they worshipped uh, idols and they were completely given over to idolatry and all kinds of, of debauchery and sin. Um, they were threatened by that. Uh, and so Amalek, these Amalekites, uh, which are mentioned later on in Scripture as, as again, being some of the worst enemies that, that Israel ever came against, they are now coming against Israel for the first time in Scripture here in Exodus chapter 17. 
Again, they've heard the news. The news has traveled ahead of the Israelites about God, his mighty works that he's performed on their behalf. And these other nations, not only are they feeling threatened, but they're a little bit scared. And this battle that's about to take place here is just as much a spiritual battle that's happening as it is a physical one. Because remember, as God's chosen people, they're going in to claim this land that they have been promised. And, and there are things going on in, in, in the spiritual realm that are at work uh, that, that are happening that is spilling over and causing this physical, real-life battle to happen. And to give a bit of history about who the Amalekites were, you know, we, we read about them several times throughout Scripture. Again, as being one of Israel's greatest enemies, we're kind of right up there with the, with the Philistines. We read about them quite a bit. They were descendants of this man, Amalek, and, and Amalek was the grandson of Esau. And if you know anything about the story of Esau, suddenly this rivalry, this hatred kind of begins to make a little sense. Uh, Esau, of course, was a, a brother to Jacob, who later became Israel, and is for whom, uh, you know, the, they, after his time, they were known as the Israelites. And the enmity and the hostility that was placed between Esau and Jacob hundreds of years prior to this happening uh, is now still kind of rearing its ugly head. And, and the Amalekites already had a, a hatred passed down for the people of Israel. And themselves, again, were leading sinful lives that went against the God of Israel. And as descendants of Esau, uh, there was always that sense of, of, of them uh, wanting to have this right that Israel had, of them wanting to be uh, favored as, as Israel was. And so already there's this hatred uh, against these people of God. So they have come, they're ready to, to completely wipe out this nation before they're ever able to make it to the land that they've been promised. So they set up in this, uh, this, uh, this place, they, they set up in this place called Rephidim, and they are ready to fight Israel. So here is what happens. Moses has told Joshua, get some men, essentially get an army together. It's the first time they've had to do this since coming out of slavery in Egypt. So get an army and uh, get them ready to fight by tomorrow. It's pretty short notice. Uh, pretty short notice to get an army together. But as we see in verse 10, it says this. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. I love what this says in verse 13. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. In other words, it was a pretty decisive victory. Now I want us to look back at this verse 12 about Moses and what's happening here. It says that when Moses would hold up his hand, that the battle would go well. And when his hands began to get tired and he would begin to let them down, the battle would not go so well for the children of Israel. So these two people, Aaron, his brother, and, and her, this other man, they came along. And it says they stayed his hands. They held his hands up. They helped him out in his time of need. And it says that his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Israel won the battle. Now let me explain something here. What Moses was doing... Was, was very important. But it wasn't some sort of magic trick. It wasn't because of any power that Moses held. Um, it wasn't some spell that Moses was performing. It wasn't any form of superstition that was happening. Sometimes we could read this and begin to get the wrong idea, but to be very clear, that, that's not what this was about. It was about a way that God was choosing to work and show to his people that any victory that they were going to accomplish was going to come through him 
and him alone. This was a way that God was showing his power. He wanted them to know that it was him and him alone that was going to grant them a victory. Again, this was their first battle. It was very important for this very young, new, fresh army to realize, yes, they've got to fight valiantly. They've got to be brave. They've got to stand up to these people that have dared to defy the very God that they trust and believe in that has delivered them out of the hands uh, of the Egyptians. But yet here they are at this place uh, knowing that they cannot completely do this on their own. And the way that God showed that to them was through Moses. You know, Moses spent so much time communing with God. Moses was so close to God. We see of the, the times that, that Moses would stand in the gap for God's people. There were times when God was angry with Israel and Moses, because of, of, of his love for his people, would, would, would commune with God in prayer and they would have these conversations uh, that are recorded and, and, and Moses would, would beg for forgiveness and for mercy for the people and, and God would grant that because of this close relationship that they had and because of the covenant that he had made with his people. And Moses was this man that kind of stood in the gap for Israel when they needed it most. And so now here he is on this hill doing this with his hands outstretched, standing in the gap for Israel. And God is moving and giving them the victory because of it. Now, I want to do something a little different. I want to do something a little different. Bring the come up here. Come on. I don't, I don't get to do these illustrations very often. I'm going to sit you right here. Since they put a rock on there, so you're Moses. There's your rock. You, you can sit under there. All right. Now he's got a... Uh, here you come. Come up here. I didn't ask y'all before him. Uh, Jim, you come up here too. Y'all can be Aaron and her. All right. Now imagine this. You've got your. It says they were on both sides of it. So you've got your left hand outstretched here. You can hold that. Hold that out here. Just, just straight up here, left hand. And you got your right hand out here too. Now I want you to imagine. You know, you're, you're holding these, and they're getting they're getting kind of heavy. So y'all y'all can help me hold these up. Hold those hands up. Now I got a question for you. First time I saw this, first time I thought about this. Can anybody tell me what this looks like? Cross. Reminds me of the cross. Reminds me of the Jesus Christ our Savior with his hands outstretched. Moses was standing in the gap for his people. Moses cared very much about his people. I believe that what we saw here was a picture of Jesus Christ. And when you read it on a page, it doesn't necessarily all come alive. But, but when you can see it as an example of this, suddenly you begin to realize what a picture of the cross hundreds, hundreds of hundreds of years before was already being placed in Scripture. Y'all can go be seated. Thank you. Now, this picture of the cross that is there all the way back in the book of Exodus, people say, you know, Old Testament, I don't get so much with Old Testament. I like the New Testament stuff. Well, it's great. The New Testament is where we find the story of Jesus. It's where we find where his blood was shed for us. But in the Old Testament, that's where we find out why we need a Savior. And we begin to see the picture of him and what he would look like. Without the prophecy and the pictures of the Old Testament, we couldn't believe the word of the New Testament. And it's because of these two things working in tandem with each other. Just as Moses was acting as someone standing in the gap, an intercessor, if you will, for Israel. They were getting the victory because of this, because of God's power and because of God working through him. Jesus now, on a cross, stood in the gap for us at a time when we were not able to fight for ourselves. In a time when we were not prepared, we were not ready we, we, we had this great debt. We had this enemy of sin that was upon us. You know, just as, as we struggle with sin in our own lives, that's something that goes back for generations. We can trace that all the way back to Adam. Because of the fall that happened in the garden, we can look at that, that sin nature and realize that that was passed down to us from Adam. Just as this conflict between Israel and the descendants of Esau, now as the Amalekites, this was something that went back before any of these people had ever been born. 
This was a, a, an enmity that was placed between them. This was uh, a, a lack of peace between them. This was a hatred from the Amalekites to the people of Israel. And, and this was something that, that went back before any of them had been born. And they were still dealing with this feud. Well, we still have to deal with the sin today that happened so many generations ago. And we're dealing with that nature being passed down. And we're dealing with the sin that's happening in our own lives. This problem that's been passed down from Adam. But because of the outstretched arms of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, we too can have victory. Victory. To live a victorious life, to live a truly victorious life, is worth more than all the silver, all the gold, every precious jewel, every diamond, all the, the cattle that there are, everything that we could possibly get, a, a, a nice truck, nice car, beautiful house. To live a truly victorious life with that peace knowing that Jesus <coughs> has already fought the battle for us. Jesus has provided us that victory. Jesus has given us everything we could ever need in life. There's nothing greater than having that promise in our lives. Jesus stood in the gap for us. Jesus is the intercessor for us. And when he does something, he does it completely. Let me tell you this. Listen, remember this verse. Where it says, and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. To discomfit someone, again, this is a decisive, complete victory. Israel knew they had won. They knew it was God that did it. And the people of Amalek knew that they had been beat. Look at the book of Hebrews. Turn and in your Bibles to the New Testament book of Hebrews. And I want to show us how we know, I believe we know that this is a picture of Jesus and, and, and we know what he has done for us. In the book of Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, it says this, Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Do you know what that word uttermost means? Completely. It's definite. He is able to save them completely. To give them that assurance that the old time preacher said, that you know, 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 that you, know, that you are his child, that he has given you that victory, that, that you have been saved from the sin that has been passed down to you, that this thing that you've struggled with for so long, uh, this hatred that the enemy has for you, he's given victory over all of that. And those wages of sin, that death uh, that, that, that has to happen, that debt that has to be paid, he has conquered all of that for us through his outstretched arms on the cross of Calvary. And I love that it says, he ever liveth. That means he's alive now and he's going to keep on living. There's never going to be a time when he is not alive. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. That's for us. For those who have been saved completely. Saved to the uttermost. There's an old song that says, I'm saved to the uttermost. And I'm glad that I am. Had a former pastor that used to put it this way. He'd say, he'll take you from the guttermost to the uttermost. Whether we saw the gutter or not, <clears throat> spiritually, that's where we all were. Spiritually, we were without hope. Spiritually, we were helpless. Spiritually, we were just like those poor young men that were put in that position when Moses told Joshua and they, they were ill-prepared, many of them probably without any proper weapons, without any form of, of, of shield or sword or, or uh, any sort of protection, but yet God was granting them the victory because Moses stood in the gap. 
There's something so important about knowing that someone else is truly doing the fighting for us. As we say, the battle might still be going on because we still deal with things from day to day, but the war has already been won. The outcome of it has already been decided. And when the outcome has already been decided, when God has already promised victory, can I tell you that makes the heat of the battle just a little bit easier to endure. When we already know how the story ends, you know, we might sit down and read a book or watch a television show or a movie and most of the time we know that a lot of these things they end up well they end up having a happy ending and yet sometimes in there we get a little nervous because things start getting a little bit and they get a little bit squirrely and we don't know which way it's going to go because that character that we like and we've been following him this whole way well he's in trouble how's he going to get out of this now but if you've already read the back or somebody's already given you a review or, or whatever it might be, you know, oh, I don't have to be so nervous. He's going to make it out. The hero always wins in the end. Well, we're not the hero. He's the hero. And he has won for us. Whatever it is that you might be dealing with today, whatever it is in your life that you might be struggling with, it might be some sin. Some addiction, some habit, something that you, you go back to or something that, that you're tempted with. Or it might simply be uh, what, what uh, Galatians calls the weights, the things that I don't believe are necessarily sinful, but those things that will weigh down on us and we begin to, to just get bogged down with life. Whatever those things might be, I can tell you this. Jesus has already paid our debt. Jesus has already stood in the gap. Jesus wants to give us victory. All it takes is for us to accept it. All it takes is for us to say yes to him. Wherever you might be, whatever you might have on your heart, he stands there still, arms outstretched, forever making intercession to the Father for us, standing in the gap between a holy God and an unrighteous man, allowing his righteousness to apply to our lives. So that when that holy God looks upon us, he sees only the Lord of his Son, the righteousness of Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you did choose to stand in the gap for us. Lord, no one took your life from you. You gave it up freely. Knowing how great the cost was. Knowing how much you would have to give. Knowing that we would at times, more often than not, be ungrateful. Knowing that some would not even accept it. Lord, I still believe there is blood enough for all. And that while there is bread, there is hope. And Lord, for those of us that have accepted, for those of us that believe on your name and, and we trust in you, Lord, let us know that we don't have to carry those things around anymore. That once we've given them to you, we don't have to pick them back up. That we can truly have peace and victory in you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. 289 as we stand.
I love that line of that verse that says, We purchased our home on Calvary's tree. Anything from anybody this morning before we get up? Anything from anybody's heart? If not, uh, okay, would you just listen to the word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this message that you've given us today.